Hello, Camden. Uh, how you all doing now? You're right. Uh, once again, Hi. I'd like to introduce you all to my friend Vicky Hamilton. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Vicky was last uh, with us in 2016, and uh, the initial release of her book *Appetite for Dysfunction*. And uh, we have a second edition out right now. So. Anybody didn't make the first one, uh, we're going to go through some stuff and I'll let you know what it's all about and obviously what Vicky's all about. So I'm going to start off. Welcome back, Vicky. Had a good shopping trip today. I did. I got new shoes. Pretty happy. Green. Yeah. And the last time I was here, I had just fallen down and like uh, sprung my tailbone. So I was on all kinds of pain meds. So I apologize if I offended anybody last time. I was time. a human crush as well, wasn't <laughs> One I? One of them, yeah. Had to. Yeah. So, uh, any, anybody that's here that doesn't know, uh, so tell us about, uh, you know, your times and how you came to be with the bands like Motley Crue, Poison, and obviously Guns N' Roses. Oh, that's a short question. Okay. <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll just go with the latter bands. Okay. I worked with a lot of bands. I mean, I started out in L.A. with Motley Crue, and um, I was a management consultant for them, and I did a lot of display merchandising and stuff. And then I worked with Striper, and uh, I, I booked them on their first big show, which was Bon Jovi's first show at the Country Club. So that was pretty cool. That was right when they started throwing Bibles at the crowd. And uh, then I decided that I wasn't a religious enough to like keep that gig. And uh, I managed Poison after that, and... Um, they got a record deal with Enigma, and I had just worked Striper that were on Enigma and knew that there wasn't going to be any money. And then, of course, they signed with Capitol Records right after that, so my loss, I guess. But um, And right after Poison, I started managing Guns N' Roses, and um, they were living with me when the bidding war broke out, and um, it was pretty, it was pretty epic, I got to say. And I think I'll read a story about the bidding war later, but we'll do a little Q&A here. Yeah, right on. So uh, as we did this uh, last year, oh no, 2016, and we kind of, the questions that we put across, we pretty much covered the book, and there was no point in fucking selling it. So <laughs> we're going we're gonna to condense this one down. By the way, the books will be on sale, and Vicky, uh, Vicky will be signing them later on. Um, so... We're going to start with a quick Q&A here now, so, and then we're going to come back to some stuff. So, anybody got any questions here so far? <laughs> Matt. It's Funny you should a, ask that. <laughs> TV or documentary about the book? I'm actually in the process of cutting a deal for a fictionalized TV um, television show and I'm working with Laura Keitlinger who's a writer on Two Broke Girls and Will and Grace and um, PJ Wolf helped me write the pilot and it's quite funny I've got an agent and all that stuff and it's been making the rounds and it's looking kind of good so we'll see Anyone else? Mikkel? <laughs> I think we did the the question a bit a bit too early. Everyone's yeah, shy yeah, here tonight, like, aren't like, they? You've got them shell shocked here. I know. By the way, with regards to the TV sh series, that's good sleuth in there. That wasn't meant to be public knowledge. <laughs> uh, I was told I'm too old to be Axel when he's 20. So, Vicky. <laughs> um. Oh. I, I saw the tour twice on this last tour. Um, it's not raw and electric like when I managed the band, and that's what I really loved about them. But it's a really good show, you know. And, of course, I miss Stephen and Izzy. I mean, to me, it's not really a reunion without all of them being there. But they had all the bells and whistles, and it's definitely worth seeing, you know. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I feared that... Uh if you can talk about this. Uh, anybody familiar with Sabina, what? Okay, she wants to know about my new, new label. La they've all done their research on you, haven't they? All these Wikipedia people. 
So, Vicky also has a new record label coming out. So, tell us yeah. about that, Vic. Um, I'm starting a label. It's going to be called Dark Spark Records. And um, I have a distribution deal with The Orchard, which I'm going to, like, sign when I go back there, which they do Sony Records and a lot of other people. And I was very excited. Um, you know, I'm going to do mostly upcoming bands and uh, stay true to my aesthetic, I guess it is. So. Of course, if they're good. Look at Mirko's <laughs> face light up right there. Hello, I'm Mirko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yo, Vicky, Vicky, only talk to them if they buy a book first and then talk to them, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, how many of you people are familiar with Hollywood Rose, the pre-Guns and Roses band? Um, so I hear, it, if this is, I've heard on the grapevine, if it's not something that's talked about, you can skip. But I've heard that uh, Chris Webber of Hollywood Rose is talking with Izzy Stradlin. That is true. I, um, I went over to Chris's house, actually took my book investors, Antonio and Soleil, over to Chris's house. So if you're out there, Antonio and Soleil, hello. Um, and uh, Izzy had called Chris, and they've had dinner, and I know that they're talking. I mean, how amazing would that be if they, like, wrote some new songs? You know, I, I'm thinking it's pretty cool since there doesn't seem to be any new songs coming out of the Guns N' Roses camp yet. I hit the new singles, a new single. A 30-year-old single. Yeah. 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 I did know him. I didn't know him well, and he wasn't in very long, so, you know. Um, I booked Hollywood Rose on with Striper and Black Sheep at a place called The Music Machine. And um, that's when Slash like sort of met Axel for the second time around from what I understand now. But I thought I introduced them, but Slash said that he had jammed with him already. So whatever. I reintroduced them and that was sort of the history of making the band. Oh, awesome. Tell him I said hello. I, you know, he like, he, I think he Facebook, I think he Facebooked me or something and I, I responded to him, but you know, it's like I've been through a lot of musicians since then. Yes. <laughs> so. yeah. Not sleeping with them, just working with them. <laughs> I, she's been through a lot yeah, of musicians yeah. since then. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Even in Rocco. So, uh, we got any more questions here? No. Uh, yeah, Rocco, we covered that bit. So, right here. yo, right. what's up? Um, Slash and Steven. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a good question. There were a couple that really stick out in my mind. One was at the Whiskey. It was like really just, they had like the strippers were like really going and they had the night train like sort of uh, cross signs going and Axel at one point like had this like whole necklace of like a bunch of shit with little guns and stuff on it and he just went Wah! and it went all out in the crowd. And I remember thinking, wow, that's really epic. <laughs> you know, it's like really live. Yeah, and they played Raji's, which was this is like little hole in the wall place off of Hollywood Boulevard, and it was very punk rock. So it was kind of a different show for them, you know. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Vicky's gonna do a bit of a reading from the book from uh, the uh, I think this this is from the signing era kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so what year would this be, Vic? It was 86. 86. Yeah. Okay, so here is an excerpt from the book around about the time of the band getting signed. Um, chapter 16, The Bidding War. For Guns N' Roses, the New Year's was off with a bang. Every show brought in more industry attention and record label people who wanted to take us to dinner. We took a meeting with Peter Philbin at Electra Records. Peter was a very likable man who had been in the industry a long time and found a lot of success with Bruce Springsteen and many others. 
He really loved the band when he saw them live at the Roxy January 18th. He took us into the conference room and talked to us about the direction of the band and how he loved what he had seen live. Peter likened the band to the Rolling Stones, which was met with band approval. Axel said at the end of the meeting, are you offering us a deal? Peter said, I really like what I saw, and I think you're really talented, but nothing is ever instant iced tea with me. I'd like to take my time to come to these kind of decisions. Axel loud and proudly responded, well, you better not take too much time or you might miss out. Peter said he knew that was true. I started shopping in a demo tape that consisted of Welcome to the Jungle, Anything Goes, Don't Cry, Back Off, and Think About You. The word about this de demo was spreading like wildfire. Record company executives began seeking me out to get their hands on a copy. Once they heard it, they were ready to meet the band. One A&R executive who I really liked was Susan Collins from Chrysalis Records. Susan was cute, petite woman from the UK who possessed a very proper English accent. I really enjoyed speaking with her. I agreed to get her a meeting with the band. She asked me what my favorite restaurant was and I told her the Ivy. So she took the five guys and me to dinner at the Ivy in West Hollywood. The band was drinking more than any five people should consume and eating like this was their first meal in months. I'm certain that the bill was well over $1,000 in 1985 money. Susan then set up a meeting for us at Chrysalis with her boss, Ron Fair. I got the band together at my apartment and we walked down Sunset Boulevard to the Chrysalis building. We almost caused an accident as people were bending their heads out of the car windows to get a look at the band as they walked down the Sunset Strip in broad daylight. We were quite a sight, a fury redhead, two blondes, and two blue-black haired rockers, and me trailing behind. Moments after we announced our arrival, we were ushered into Ron Fair's office. Axel sat, sat, propped his legs up on Ron's desk, sporting his snakeskin cowboy boots with fresh duct tape that held the soles together. Ron smiled at Axel and then introduced himself to the whole band. His hard sell began with why the band should sign with Chrysalis. He then took out a pad of paper and drew big dollar signs on five sheets of paper and handed it to each one of the band members. This is what you will get when you sign with Chrysalis, Ron said to the band. Axel looked at me and whispered in my ear, is he fucking kidding us? How much money are we talking about? I asked the question out loud. Ron said, a lot. He goes, let me get with the legal affairs department and get back to you with the exact number. Axel then turned to Susan with a poker face and said, if you will run down Sunset Boulevard naked, we will consider signing with you. For a minute, I think she was actually considering it, but then declined the offer. Karen Birch from Music Connection Magazine called me and asked me if we could do an interview with the band for a cover story. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, I said gladly. I was thinking to myself that this was just what the band needed to drive the bidding war even higher. Great, she said. Can I do the interview at your apartment? I had to think for a moment. Did I really want her to in my ramsack department? I was living with the band at this point. This is why, but <laughs> it was a mess. Can't, this, can't we do this somewhere else, I asked. I really like to get them in their true environment, she said. My place is a big fat mess, I told her. That's okay, it will make for good storytelling. I, re I reluctantly agreed. The interview went pretty well, and I was proud that they were so good with the press. That was until Karen went to the bathroom and they started whispering things into her tape recorder that were not very nice. Later I found out that they had actually broken her tape recorder, but in an unusual act of kindness, they had loaned her one of theirs to finish the interview. It was around that time that Weasel, maniacal record producer Kim Fowley re-entered the picture. Kim had gotten wind of the band and was talking about them to whoever would listen. He was saying things like, Axl Rose would be the love child if Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin had a baby. 
I walked into the apartment one day to find Kim and one of his minions sitting on the couch offering Axel $2,500 for publishing rights for three songs on the demo. I couldn't believe my ears. I pulled Axel aside and said, what are you thinking? This is a terrible idea. Those songs are worth a lot more than $2,500. Axel looked me in the eye and said, we really need the money right now and I can write a million songs. I said, no, maybe you can write a million more songs, but I don't know if you can write a million more songs as good as these. And you have a record label bidding war going on right now. You can't tie any of these songs up. Axel then tells Kim that he will have to think about it. Kim looks at me with daggers in his eyes. The tension in the room got so thick you could cut it with a knife. I excused myself and went into the bedroom and started throwing dirty clothes into a laundry basket. I walked past Kim, his slave, and Axel, and then downstairs into the dark laundry room to begin washing my clothes. The next thing I knew, Kim Fowley was standing behind me, yelling at me, and his arms were like flying everywhere, <laughs> telling me that I had ruined his deal. He claimed that he had been the one who pushed all the record labels to become interested in the band, and that he deserved a cut of their publishing. Not going to happen, I said to him as I escaped under his arm while he was exhibiting one of those famous rages. I was really scared. Kim was a tall, scary-looking man, and he was truly angry enough to hurt me. From that moment on, Kim Fowley really had it in for me and was trying to discredit me. He would say things like, Vicky doesn't know what she's doing, or Vicky's too pretty to manage this band. At any rate, he did not get a piece of Guns N' Roses publishing. As I write this, it was published that Kim had medicated and raped original Runaways bassist Jackie Fox in front of the entire band. In my opinion, this is not a nice guy. Kim died of bladder cancer early in 2015. On February 28th, Guns N' Roses were to play the Troubadour. Earlier that afternoon, Stephen was trying to help me clean up the apartment and was throwing beer bottles into a hefty bag. Axel, who was asleep on the couch, woke up from the noise. With one eye open, he glared at Stephen and said, Stop it. Stephen continued to help, and then Axel said, I said, Stop it. Stephen threw another bottle into the bag, and Axel snapped. He jumped up and threw this heavy wood coffee table at Stephen with cigarette butts, ashtrays, trash, and bottles. Yanging at Axel, then he attacked Stephen, throwing punches wildly connecting at least one in the face. They began fighting on the floor. Oh my God, stop it, I screamed. You're going to kill your drummer the day of the showcase? Axel finally eased up as seasons Steven spun away with a very red eye and yelled, You're fucking crazy, asshole. I was just trying to help Vicky clean up. And then he ran out the door. By sound check, everyone had cooled down. And when we arrived at the Troubadour for the show... I counted 16 A&R people, at least 16 that I knew of. The band put on a killer yet very loud show. They built train track crossing signs that blinked on and off with the tempo of their song Night Train, which was super cool. Even though the song was about a cheap wine, the band liked the idea of represent, re representing a real train on the stage. A few songs into the set, I look over my shoulder and notice that a lot of A&R people were leaving. I walked outside to see where they were going, and to my horror, I saw most of them standing outside talking to each other. Peter Philbin introduced me to Tom Zutat on the curb in front of the Troubadour. Tom said that he would like to talk to me, so I walked away from the front door where the music was blaring so I could hear him better. I asked, what are you thinking about the band? Tom said, I really like them, but it was so loud I couldn't really tell if the singer could sing. Can he sing? He looked at me with piercing blue eyes. Oh yeah, he can really sing, I said. Handing Tom the demo tape, Tom thanked me and says, I'll call you tomorrow after I've listened to the tape. If he can really sing, I'll sign them. I smiled and shook his hand and said, I look forward to hearing from you. I walked back over to the sea of A&R people, mingled with them all, and set up more lunches and meetings. I loved that the attention the band was receiving and it felt like my dreams were coming true. As crazy as it was living with this band, I could see the big payday was coming in the near future. And of course, that was the beginning of rock and roll history. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Um, so we got
any more questions here before we wrap up? Think hard, everybody. Come on. It's going to be another two years till the next one. Oh, he's waving? You got, no, no, he's not waving at us. They're waving at the people at the fucking door. When I'm saying ask questions, don't wave over there, dude. Cool. Uh, what about up there in the corner? Anybody questions? No, we done? Okay. Well, look, uh, we're going to wrap up here, guys. Thank you all for uh, listening. We've got some books on sale, and Vicky's going to be doing a sign-in as well. You want to find out more about this and stuff to do with uh, the other band? What's that? The what? The stuff with crew and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So her time's mo managing Motley Crew as well. Um, I didn't manage them. I was a consultant. Consulting Motley consultant. Crew as well is in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a lot more stuff, Guns N' Roses related, and uh, just basically uh, everything Vicky's done. And I uh, think we've covered what she's continuing to do. But uh, thank you once again all for listening, and uh, thank you Total Rock Radio up there for uh, staying around a bit longer. <laughs> and, but yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Vicky Hamilton. And if you'd like to buy a book, go on, they're 20 pounds. They were 25, so I just kind of want to, like, let them go so I can go back. And they're not, they're not available in the U.K. shops at the moment, so uh, the only place you can get them is here now, or if you know Off me. my website. Or yeah. Vicky's website, or my house, or if Amazon. you know me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's about it. Or gaffelvis.com. Um, there's no such site, but, you know. <laughs> But anyway, uh, before Metalworks, uh, we're going to do uh, the Shadow of Your Love song and a few other Guns N' Roses songs. Be and then a Santa and Steph. Yep. Everybody get it for King Steph up there. <laughs> Just seen that's all going, you know what I mean? <laughs>